So, uh, welcome to this uh, lecture in this, the UC Connect series that's uh, been going all year here at the University of Canterbury. Uh, my name is Colin Fee, and I am the head of the new School of Product Design that is uh, being formed as we speak. In fact, we're almost looking at it, uh, except uh, that we've been putting a lot of effort into our space development, our uh, uh, recruitment of teaching staff, and our curriculum development, of course, as we go forward. So uh, we're all geared up and ready to go for the beginning of next year when we set down new students. I do have a couple of housekeeping matters just to take care of. As we go forward, hopefully I can get this thing working. Uh, and they are just uh, essentially, firstly, to welcome you, but also just to point out that the uh, toilets, the bathrooms, are around out of this room down the stairs where you came in and through in the core building uh, and one of our two helpers our hosts tonight Vicky or Stuart would help you uh, direct you to those but there should be signposts to the toilets in the core of the building uh, if you do happen to hear a fire alarm just follow uh, the uh, the evac us to the evacuation meeting point and so you can follow me there are uh, actually I see a number of university staff in here, but we also have our hosts again, Vicky and Stuart, uh, who will help guide you to those places. Um, if we do have uh, an earthquake, as you're probably well rehearsed by now, just drop and hold, wait for the shaking to stop, and then we will gather outside again at the evacuation spot, which is out the very front of this building on Crack Road, or if that is not possible, for some reason, we will gather uh, across the <coughs> playing fields as necessary. Okay. So just a brief introduction uh, to you uh, about myself. Uh, I was uh, born and raised and educated here in Christchurch. I spent some time uh, in other places, um, chiefly in Hamilton in, in the North Island at the University of Waikato for a number of years after, after I finished my postdoctoral work. Um, originally I tossed up between engineering and music as a career and uh, I followed the engineering uh, pathway, partly because my parents sort of influenced me that way. I said, that's the one that will actually earn you some money, uh, the other one may not. And I think they were dead right, because I was incapable of playing a whole piece without making a mistake uh, on the piano. So I, I think um, I've translated that into engineering hope without making too many mistakes. Uh, I have a partner, Glenda, for, for the last 28 years. We have three children, they're aged 18 to 22, they're all university age. Uh, and as I say, I was at the University of Waikato for uh, some years between 1991 and 2005 and I helped develop the uh, engineering and technology programs that uh, are taught up there. Um, had some periods overseas and that's, that's been very interesting. It's one of those benefits that you have as a university academic, that you get time uh, once every so often to spend some time away from your duties on the campus and spend them in other places. And I've been able to live in, the, in Canada and the States and uh, in Sweden and most recently in the UK. So it's been uh, a way of, of uh, I guess, enlarging my view of the world, finding out how people live in other places and just exploring other ways of doing things, which has uh, been quite valuable for me. Uh, I came here in 2006 as a professor of chemical engineering and I've been in chemical engineering all the way up until this year when I have now moved over to the School of Product Design. Uh, I was uh, the Dean of Engineering uh, for the last four years and I think that gave me a good understanding of the breadth of the nine engineering programs that we teach here at uh, Canterbury, all the way from civil and mechanical engineering through electrical, chemical, right through to forest engineering, root and software engineering. There's quite a breadth and it is something that I'm relatively comfortable with that you can have a degree which teaches some very fundamental things that has some commonality but actually covers very, very broad uh, career paths and industries and types of technology that those people are uh, experts in. I'm very proud to have uh, introduced a new uh, diploma into engineering a couple of years back, and this is part of trying to expand our thinking and to move with the times, and this was a diploma of uh, global humanitarian engineering, and this is uh, quite unique uh, certainly in New Zealand, uh, there is now another program in Australia, but I think we may have been the first. And this is a, a diploma that engineering students can add on to the side of their engineering 
program and study while they're doing their engineering, whether they're doing software engineering or natural resources uh, is of no consequence. It's really uh, about people wanting to do uh, some social good with the things that they're learning and they can add that on without any, adding, adding any extra time. But it expands them into the humanities and some thoughts about uh, engineering for the third world countries, disaster relief and so on. And then most recently is the new Bachelor of Product Design, which I'll talk about briefly today. Um, but this is, I think, uh, for me, one of the most exciting things that I've been involved in in a long time. Um, and I would say that because I'm doing it now, right? <laughs> but actually, uh, in the past, all, all that I've done has been studying engineering, preparing for engineering, researching engineering, teaching engineering, developing engineering programs. And, and that has been uh, very fulfilling. But this is something quite different, and we are talking about a whole different type of student coming to the university because of it. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. But more on that later. When I first uh, agreed to do this talk, uh, someone asked me for a title, and I said, oh, okay, uh, how about this one? Um, and last week, or the week before, when I started looking at that title again, I thought, who suggested that as a title? It's kind of a stretch, isn't it? So it's a bit ambitious for product designers to shape the world. And when I really thought about it, it really is about the interactions we have with products that actually influences how we interface with the world and can have a great influence on the way the world actually is. So we can look at it in different scales and uh, I will touch very briefly on the global scale um, but it's more to me at the moment about the local scale, the national scale, mm. how New Zealand sees its place in the world and fits here, in particular with Christchurch, and then the individual, because the way we interact with things is how we actually experience the world many times. And so the individual, is the influence of products on those individuals is actually a very, very important aspect. And I'll spend quite a bit of time on that. So global issues, it's very clear that we have a number of very pressing pro problems in the world and one that may have come to, to light more recently and you will have seen on the news recently is the, uh, the problems with uh, plastic waste disposal, uh, the levels of the, the amount of plastic that we, see, we find in the sea, uh, the plastic beads that people have had in their cosmetics and are now in the waste treatment and gone out through the, the river systems out to the sea, uh, the effect of that on, on wildlife, the effect of that on us is something that really is not sustainable and it's something that we need to understand and to work on to create sustainable products. So this is one of the things um, that we will be very aware of in, in the new degree program. Another one is climate change and I don't <coughs> hold myself as any kind of expert on this. Um, but I, like many other sort of lay people in the area, have a gut feeling that something's going on here. That, that there is something that is, is leading to more extreme weather events. Uh, I don't hold to, to good old Donald um, when he says there's nothing to it. We don't need to do anything about it. Actually, I think we do. And it's something that uh, has become very evident. In fact, this, uh, let's see if I can make sure this is on. There we go. This one here is, is a picture taken off the news uh, just today. It's in, in California, where all <coughs> suburbs have just been completely wiped out by fires. Uh, we've all seen these pictures of lonely polar bears floating around on a piece of sea ice because of the shrinkage of the Arctic ice pack. Uh, at the same time, severe drought and severe floods and large weather events and, uh, and so on. Um, these are all things that we, we need to keep in mind as we are developing new technologies and new products. Um, I would say possibly my opinion is that these are more for other areas than necessarily product designers. I think obviously we could look for more energy efficiency, we could find services and products that will reduce our amount of energy we're using, maybe reduce the amount of CO2 and methane and other greenhouse gases we're putting into the air. These are small things that we can do, but they are large infrastructure things that need experience and knowledge across a whole range of fields, um, in, including from science right through uh, to environmental science, chemistry, engineering, and the social sciences. 
So when you look at a product, you need to look at the whole life cycle because these are the things that influence the global effects on things like climate change and like the environment uh, and pollution. So we would say, uh, we could say we have a product here where we have sales, someone buys a product, they use, the customers use it, and then we would ideally like to recycle. Uh, and then we move right around this whole circle like this, and as you can see, there's energy coming in, there's resources <coughs> coming in, and as you've used these things by customers and sold things, there's packaging, and there's the, the, um, the products at the end of their life are being discharged into waste and disposal. And we need to think about all of those things when we're designing products in terms of trying to get sustainable products. And we have to do that right from this point here, product planning and design. <coughs> so then thinking more about local issues, <coughs> What is it that, that we want to do? One of the visions that I have for this particular degree in this particular area of product design is that we are going to create more wealth for the country. And the reason I want to do that is because that's the way we afford the things that actually make our society work, <coughs> the fact that we're a first world society. They're the things we need if we want a better education system, more investment in education. They're the things you need if you need more health care and retirement funds. And all of those things that we actually want to do to make our society function like we want to. And to do that, we have to earn wealth. And to do that, we have to export and, and bring in export earnings. And I think uh, many people have, have said this, that we need to double our wealth creation and our export earnings. But I don't think personally that we're going to do that by doubling our farming intensity, by doubling our dairy or even by doubling our tourism without major impacts on the environment. Now, I'm not dismissing those areas. I think they're important parts of our economy. But I can't imagine the idea of trying to double the, the export earnings from those particular sectors without having any impact on the environment at all. What I'd rather do is see us develop more of these kinds of uh, attractive global um, products that are actually going out there and, and earning export earnings. If you think about some of the countries right now that are good at design, you're probably thinking about places like Italy and Sweden and Denmark, so the Scandinavian areas, Italy, maybe France. And those are the, those are the kinds of places you want to aspire to if you want to, to actually be part of that whole global uh, experience. So we want New Zealand to be numbered amongst those kinds of places that are, are developing these really <coughs> attractive and functional products. So with problems come opportunities, of course. And here's some local opportunities here. So these were some of the, um, the uh, design awards that were announced just this week. Uh, and you can find those um, uh, on the website. I've got a, a website link uh, on one or two of the next slides. And essentially, this is a, a company called Innocent Packaging. They have a, um, an office in Auckland. They have an office in, in, in Christchurch. And they've looked at the life cycle analysis here where you're looking at the whole circle here of design for sustainability, the processing impact on the environment. It's not just the waste that you're producing. It's actually what are you using to actually make the product in the first place and is it solvents? Is it other things? Is it gases that you are releasing? The materials resources of extraction. Do we have to mine more materials to do this? Is the overall impact on the on the environment actually sustainable, or is it something that's uh, actually net a uh, net loss? End of life issues like recycling materials for green energy, sustainable materials, economic, social, and legislative issues, and back and so on. And, and this group here, Innocent Packaging, have made uh, a whole range of packaging, disposable packaging, which is all made of plant-based materials. So all of the things that you see there have been made of plant-based materials, largely polyethylactic acid, I think, PLA, even this clear cup here. Um, so that it's, it's made so that you can actually have that sustainability in mind. So there's an opportunity which has been turned into a business opportunity. This person here, I don't know how many of, how many of you know Brianne West? 
You want to do the Brienne West? Yeah, I know if you have. She's my local hero, actually. I think she's just done a fantastic job. She was a student here at the university in biochemistry and biology. And uh, the way she tells the story, she was uh, in the shower and knocked over the shampoo and it all drained out. And she thought to herself, um, why am I, or why are people packaging up 90% water into a plastic bottle and shipping it around the world when I'm standing in a shower getting drenched with water? What's wrong with this picture? And so that very question suddenly offered that opportunity to her and she was able to think, well, why don't I make the shampoo without the water? So she makes these solid beauty bars and ships them around and, and that has led further to these ideas of more ethical, sustainable principles behind that business, which are all kind of an integral part of the whole product design that she's doing. Give up the bottle, sure, stop, stop sending plastic around the place, but also extend that out to some other principles that you might feel strongly about and actually design your products that are compatible with that. And she's been named in US foreign policy magazine's 100 leading global thinkers. That's something for a 20-something-year-old Christchurch school. So products ex affect how individuals experience the world. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a child, a teenager, whether you are uh, uh, disabled in some way, whether you are past retirement age, you're still interested in life. I saw someone say the other day to Terry Gilliam, Gilliam uh, from Monty Python, he's 70 something, he's still directing movies. And one of the reporters said, you know, is it time to retire? Have you thought about retiring? He said, what do you mean, is it time for me to wait to die? <laughs> People of that age are not interested in just shutting down and sitting and doing nothing. They want to interact with the world. They want products and things that they can actually enjoy. And whether you're just having a coffee out with friends or at home, whether you're riding a new kind of electric um, monocycle, whether you're enjoying cosmetics and beauty products, all of these things are products that have to be designed and built and bought and consumed and recycled. So who are these product designers? I think a lot of people think of product designers and a slightly way out kind of people there. Just a little bit uh, kind of maybe flaky, maybe odd, outside the box thinkers. Um, certainly this is how we were probably taught to think of product designers when we were doing engineering. We were taught to, sus to suspect a lot of different types of, of um, uh, professions. Accountants, social scientists, architects, and so on, but you learn through experience, actually, a lot of people have value in the world, and we just have to recognize what it is. But people are a little afraid that if they get stuck into product design, they're going to be classified in a particular way. I don't think that's true at all. I think it's actually a modern uh, way of, of learning, and it's a modern way that we need our, our graduates to, to behave. Um, one of the things that, that we're always asked is, is this all about aesthetics? Is that what product designers do? So I was rung up last week by someone in a local industry, um, and I won't say who, I don't know if they're in the audience or not, but they have a, a new idea for a scientific instrument, and they thought it would be nice if they, they offered that as a competition for our students in product design to design the, the casing <coughs> and the look and feel of that instrument so it could look really space age. And I thought, that's really nice. I, I, I like that. I like that, that challenge. It's something that our designers would certainly engage in, and we'd be willing to do that, although we've got to wait a, a year or two before we start to prepare them. But it's not what designers just do. It's not <coughs> actually the main thing that designers do. And I'm going to go through uh, an individual designer and one of the designs he came up with and try and sort of show you what that process has been, because it's not about aesthetics. That's only part of it. It's also about the whole function and use of whatever product it is that you're designing. It's also about the services. And it's about what it is of value that the consumer gets out of that product and what other opportunities there are to connect with other things. Another idea is, is this all about, you know, kind of dumb ideas. Seeing lots of things like chairs you can't sit on. 
watering cans that do themselves or gum boots with holes in the front. And you know, you've seen that kind of stereotype. They're, they're fun to play with. And I think that's another element of product <coughs> design. There's a certain playfulness in the way they're actually creating the product in the end. You need that playfulness to actually explore things and find out things that you wouldn't have thought of before. And one of the, the designers I met overseas talked about um, one of the exercises they did when they were training, and that was to build a chair that you couldn't sit on. And she asked, why is that? Why are we building a chair you wouldn't sit on? That's useless, isn't it? And the answer was, well, actually, if you consider what a chair is, 95% of the time, it's not saddle. 95% of the time, people see it. It's sitting over there. It's under a table. It's against a wall. But actually, no one's really sitting on it. So if you, if you take it from that perspective, 95% 90, of its use is actually aesthetic. It's not actually for sitting on. It's not functional. So why don't you try and play with that idea and then see what pops out of it? And it's just a way of opening out your imagination and thinking beyond what we already accept in terms of what we think things should actually be. So there's a few more dumb ideas here. Just because you can build them doesn't mean you should. I thought I might send a box of these to the NRA. It could solve a few problems. Anyway. But here's some excellent ideas. These are some of the more of the things that came out of the um, design awards. <coughs> so these ones were announced. This one here I, I particularly like. Nobody needs this. But a lot of people may want it. And a lot of people may actually use it. You can imagine, as the designer uh, himself said, that you could actually create a whole new sport out of this. People could ride these things competitively. And so these are just human-powered bikes that work on this sort of aerofo uh, hydrofoil uh, principle that you see in America's Cups yachts. And it's just a really nice idea. Who knows where that one will go. This one here got a, uh, an award. It's Nicole Austin. She's from Massey University, the College of Creative Arts. And she created this thing. It's called the Moray Land, Land Detailers for um, Tailing Lands. And it got the, the award because of the amount of research that went the back of this. And I think that's another aspect of design that people don't really uh, understand or appreciate is just how much research goes into the background of understanding the context and the function that we're trying to, to create. And you'll see this written here. I apologize for the language, but it says, far as a simple, we want simple shit. Simple shit that does the job. I'm not here to buy all of this. And that designer picked that up and created this, did all these prototypes, working through until she came up with this, this product, taking into account the end user needs. Not what she wanted to design necessarily, but what the user would find value with. And that's another aspect. This one here, excellent ideas, DNA Immigration, got awards for this for um, Information for people who are looking to immigrate to New Zealand. I don't know, maybe after tomorrow we won't have so many people wanting to immigrate to New Zealand. But this has is, is got uh, awards for the simplicity, also the look and feel, and the way you can find I want to come to New Zealand to study, to work, to visit. And the information you're given, the imagery, is nice and simple. It puts it in a, a quick, easy to find place. And once you actually select what it is you want to do, you get directed down a pathway that actually gives you the information you need, not what someone else wants to just give you, but what you actually want to find and what's going to be useful. This one here, picking up on design of this whole sort of back to nature idea and the simplicity of the design and an inter uh, integral kind of feel and look to a brand. And that was why I got that uh, particular award. So an interesting report came out this year also, which has uh, been on the news lately, and it was uh, actually commissioned by the um, design company, which is a consortium of design schools around the country, uh, but also Stephen Joyce asked for it to be done. 
Research reveals that if design were treated as an individual industry, its contribution to the NZ economy would be larger than agriculture and on a par with retail trade of more than $10 billion per year in the past year. Also provides approximately 94,000 full-time equivalent design positions in New Zealand, roughly about 4.5% of employment. So it's not a small sector, and I think there is plenty of opportunity for it to grow. So, what do product designers actually do? Product designers, I think, create and develop ideas that solve problems, essentially. So if you look at it in this way, we could sort of lay this out into bullet points, and this is why probably an engineering uh, design team would look at this, or an engineering um, class might look at it. Identify a problem or an opportunity, or maybe it's been brought to you. Understand the user, understand the context. <coughs> Possibly a little less of understanding the user, more about the functionality that's being uh, required. So the engineer would look at the function. Probably not spend as much time looking at the users, arguably. Brainstorm ideas, as usual, but the product design are often highly visual. Lots of sketching, lots of prototypes, lots of rendering and thinking about things. Choose particular ideas to develop further, prototype them, propose a solution, and then refine it and job done. Okay, but that's a very linear kind of a process. Actually, what you do uh, in many times as you just repeat around this thing. You brainstorm ideas, you choose one, you prototype it, you figure out it didn't really work all that well, you try another one, you carry on around and around in that circle before you get to the point where you propose the final solution and then refine it. <coughs> but in fact, it's even more complex than that, less linear in the product design sense because actually very often you don't even know what the the product or the problem or the opportunity is until you've already started designing the end product uh, solution. You don't know until you take that back to the user and sometimes the user doesn't understand what the problem is until they've seen what you're proposing as the solution. So you have to iterate around and back and forth. It's a very holistic kind of a way of looking at design. It's not linear, start and logically work your way through. Uh, so it's not design an aircraft engine it is, or a bridge over this river. It is instead, why do we even want to get across the river in the first place? And if I suggest a way of getting across the river, maybe it's not a bridge. Or maybe there's another way you could go around. Why don't I design a road? Et cetera, et cetera, right? So you have to keep thinking about that. And that's what designers do. So the question is, can you actually put that into a, a program of study and teach people how to do it. And is it rational? So what I want to do now is go through an example. And this one is from a, a guy called Rito Tony. And uh, he's a, a, a young guy I met earlier this year in London. He was at Imperial College and he's just done his, his uh, innovation design engineering degree. And he ended up inventing this wheelchair here which he has now patented part of that uh, design and is, is perhaps going into commercial production. So what he says here, one of the central aims of the project is to shift the perception of wheelchairs. I don't want wheelchairs to be considered aid devices originating from hospital, but mobility devices that are about dynamics, motion, maybe even a sense of freedom for the user. That's why the project draws a lot of inspiration for the bicycle industry. So here's some of the things that, uh, that Rito did as he went through this whole process. He started actually, and I'm not expecting you to read that text by the way, I'll pick out the things that I need you to know. But he started out by looking at a whole range of things and diverging his thought patterns. So he knew he wanted to work on something about mobility devices for people who are otherwise disabled. He looked at transhumanism for a start. There's a whole field there which he researched. And this person here, his name is Neil Harbinson, um, actually is colorblind. And so he went to a team of people and said, can I have some way I can see color or, or feel color? And they created an audio device which would give him feedback on color through audio waves. 
and he was able to then understand colour a lot better, actually sense that, and then was able to expand that to the to the area of UV light and infrared light, which we can't see, and take those and get additional spectrum information, which is coming to him, so he's actually able to, in a way, become superhuman in that area of sensory perception. It becomes very natural, because his brain actually tunes into that. This person here, uh, Victoria Modesta, was looking at a prosthetic for a leg, and you can see that's much more of an artistic kind of aesthetic design, maybe not particularly um, practical, you could say. But it does cause you to think about why it is we design prosthetics to be very medical and very sort of, um, uh, conservative. And this guy here climbing up using these prosthetic devices, which are actually giving him better climbing ability than he would have had with his natural needs. So just understanding a bit more that you can go beyond the body and actually use some of these things to extend what the body can do. And then taking that further, looking at this guy here with an exoskeleton on. So an exoskeleton which is helping support this guy's legs. Here's a guy with a prosthetic arm and hand which are improving almost daily through the use uh, through the, the te new technologies that uh, engineers and scientists are developing to the point where you can power that thing. You can imagine trying to create and design something like that that you actually want to have on your arm that doesn't weigh too much, that doesn't need to be plugged in the wall so that you can't actually move around, so how do you power it, and can give you sensory feedback so that when you pick something up like a can of Coke, you don't crush it, or you don't drop it and fumble it getting the dexterity and getting the feedback. And these days, these things are even starting to, to respond to brain waves and mind control. Whereas in the past, they would have been a sort of a shrug of the shoulder to close the hand, a tensing of a certain muscle. And nowadays, they are actually starting to, to react in the same way that you, most of you in this room, can do things just by thinking about it. He then went on and, and devised a little device here which gave, us, gave him audio feedback on his balance to extend and think about how his balance works. When people are confined to a wheelchair, they very often retain forward and backward movement so that they can get in and out of the wheelchair and are able to stay upright in the wheelchair, but they lose their lateral movement because it's not uh, being used. And he wanted to know what he could do to extend that out and to experience that. So he made this thing which actually <coughs> responded to balance and, and used that while he was on a bike and was able to get additional information for his normal sort of sensory perceptions while he was doing that. Now, it turns out not to be all that useful, but it's a way of exploring and playing with the area and starting to expand out from what you are uh, thinking about in the first place, which is how you can make some of these things extend what we can do, not just replace the function that you've lost in a slightly uh, less interesting way. This one here is looking at uh, developing a wobbly <coughs> stick that would actually respond to hand and arm movements and adjust its stiffness depending on what you did with that. Uh, and as it says here, while it didn't have any use at all, it turned out to become quite an inspiring object if it looked if I looked at it as a cardboard spine that offered some really delightful movements. Now, you would never hear that in an engineering class, I can tell you that. Because what we would do in an engineering class is we would analyze this thing to death. We would put numbers on it. We would work out the loads and the bending moments and the tensions and the stresses and the strains. And we would get digital feedback and all this stuff. He's saying, this gave me some de delightful movements. And it's a way of expressing things that brings in that sort of artistic view of the world that we often lose when we're talking about technology. You know, when you're, when you're talking about art, of course, and there's, there'll be artists in the audience here, there are ways of expressing things that we can't express in science or in maths. And they're nonetheless valuable. And this is one way that designers are able to think about those things and not necessarily put numbers on them, but actually ascribe feelings things and sensations. So here he is with his little crutch there, and he's built that. Now he's making a wheelchair. Why is he mucking around with this crutch? It's because
because he's diverging his thought out and trying to figure out what's going on, it might be that at some point he re realises he doesn't actually want to make a wheelchair. He wants to make something else. That's okay. That's what designers can do. Made an experimental wheelchair. This thing has rotation of the back. Uh, this way, uh, around in a circle, the platform here moves and he has this kind of movement at the front which gives more dexterity to the movement of the wheelchair and of course he, he uh, recruited a couple of acquaintances to try these things out and just sort of start to explore. So he's prototyping, trying new things, seeing if it works. He had to research spinal cord injuries because what's the point of making something that no one can use? So he had to figure out what degree of movement do people have. If I've got the sense that maybe lateral movement is kind of interesting, how many people are able to do that when they're confined to a wheelchair? And so he did a little bit of research and found that the majority of, or the largest number of, of injuries is down at this part, the lower part of the spine. And so there is a significant part of the market who would actually function with something like this. So this is again more research. So this isn't about making pretty pictures, it's about understanding the context. He also looked at ergonomics, the body of the user. What size am I? What size are you? How broad are your shoulders? How long is your arm? Where does it bend? What would your hand fit around? All of these things are ergonomics that you need to understand. In fact the university library is, is um, fortunate to have something called human scale, uh, which is a set of volumes in our, in our library, which is uh, all of these dimensions of people of all different ages and genders, so that we can understand what they need to do physically to operate something. We then looked at ideation, so I thought about these from different areas, <coughs> sketched out different ideas for walking sticks, crutches, uh, a walker system, prosthetics, a wheelchair, etc., etc. Again, thinking broadly, trying to, to rationalize and come up with a system, came up with all sorts of sketches, <coughs> and actually started thinking, one of the things that users don't like about wheelchairs is they tend to have a sort of a cage-like frame that they have to sit in. It's very confining, and it's not very exciting, and particularly for a young person who wants to get out there and start to be active, so he thought about actually putting the frame down underneath the seat <coughs> and getting them slightly between the, the feet or the legs. So it actually gives that much greater sense of freedom across there. Prototyped, 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 came up with a final design, got into a wheelchair, spent a day in it, and understood what it was like to be in a wheelchair. Got, got some experience, tried out some simple designs for how you might steer it with a skateboard, which didn't turn out to work. <laughs> That's okay, it's called prototyping. Back to the drawing board. Thought about colour schemes, if you're talking about a, a fairly sort of medical type of device, you'd want something relatively conservative here, but if it was a sporty type device, you might put some more interesting colours into it. So it's all part of the design. And then thought about how it's going to be made. Instead of making a one size fits all, we thought, well, why, why don't we use 3D printing now to customise for a particular person their size, shape, uh, height, all of those things, and build these things as one-offs. So this is the way it's constructed. <coughs> and then, of course, tested it out. So I'm going to show you what this thing does. And what I want you to look for is the way in which it is actually uh, operated. The thing about wheelchairs, normal wheelchairs, is you have to push both wheels to go straight forward. And if you want to turn this way, you push this one more than the other one, or you slow the other one down. The thing is you need two hands. And if you try and wheel it with one hand, you go around in circles, which is no fun. If you want to hold a cell phone while you're wheeling along, or pick up a packet off a supermarket shelf, or have a cup of coffee, as you're wheeling along, you've got no way of doing that with a standard wheelchair. So he wanted to improve that by using that lateral movement to actually steer the chair through a coupling through to the front wheels. So this is what he did, I've got a little video which shows him you know, some people actually using it. See she's wheeling with one hand, 
to just lean and actually move around. And interesting that they're on a, on a tennis court. You know, thinking about wheelchair sports and what you know very active people might do in this situation. So they're not. These people are actually don't have use of their legs. They're not using their feet to do any tricks or anything to steer this thing. They're actually just using that slight lateral movement, which is coupled from that back support through to the front wheels. Actually, that's the bit he's patented, and I think it's got uh, a long way to go. Okay, impressive work, but what's missing from this process, in my opinion, uh, with all the good work uh, that he has done, is the business side. What is the market? Can you make money out of it? Is it sustainable? If I go into business and make three of these things, will I then go out of business and leave people upset? Or can I keep it going and keep expanding it and making it available? And so one of the things we've done with our new design degree is we make sure there's a business element in there so that all the students will do some marketing and some management as well as that creative design as well as the science and the engineering. And I think that's what makes it uh, a fairly unique addition to those New Zealand design degrees. So, industry wants for UC graduates specialists in traditional fields. There's no shortage of that. I have no problem with people doing specialist degrees. Uh, but an increasing demand for graduates that are creative thinkers, they're adaptable, adding value across the organisation, entrepreneurial. And we went to the Entree Awards last night, tremendous entrepreneurial activity going on there, and technical ability able to follow through ideas in a practical way. So we have these three majors, an industrial product design, applied immersive game design, and uh, a chemical natural healthcare product formulation major as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about this one here. Because this is sometimes the response you get. Gaming? Seriously? You know, don't our kids already spend enough time on games? And this is the picture people have of gamers. But actually gamers look like this. Any of those people are gamers. Is it serious? Yes, it's serious. The game, the video game industry outweighs the movie, entire movie industry globally in terms of income and turnover. <coughs> That's a huge industry and it's getting bigger and bigger. And we haven't even started to touch the idea of virtual reality, augmented reality applications in education and healthcare and rehabilitation and industry training and so on. It's going to explode very soon. This is just one example. It's my son's favourite tournament. It's a, a game called uh, Defence of the Ancients, Dota, Dota 2. They have a competition which he went to a couple of years ago. He flew up to, uh, to Seattle with a couple of his friends. This is the stadium where they do that game. That's the finals competition. The prize pool started with a base of 1.6 million from its sponsors. And then it gets crowdfunded from the fans of the game. The final total prize pool was 24.7 US million dollars for this one tournament that has 16 teams competing each other over a period of three days. It is so popular, they have huge screens on the outside of the stadium so that you can sit on the grass and watch it just like Wimbledon. Right? It is a huge, huge industry. 5 million concurrent viewers. For Leagues of Legend, almost 15 million. So who are these people? 155 million Americans play games regularly. Four out of five households have a game console. Average age is 35 years, not 15, not 12, 35. <laughs> Average number of years they've been playing games, 13. They're not all males. 48% of females play <coughs> games. This is a bit skewed. 75% of games industry are male at the moment. I think that needs to change, obviously, because of this. You think Americans like games, that's them. This is China. <laughs> I haven't even thought to see where the statistics will be from India as that country grows its middle, uh, middle class wealth. 
What about New Zealand? The aim, average aim was 33, so that's about the same. 88.5% of households have a gaming device of some sort. All homes, apparently, according to the survey at least, with children less than 18 have a device. 44% of females, they tend to favour these kinds of games. 56% of males, they tend to favour these kinds of games. 91% of New Zealanders, 6 to 15, play games. 43% of people over the age of 50 play games. These are surprising statistics. What is game design? It's not about playing games. That's not what the degree is. We're not going to have people in here just playing games all the time. Although, yeah. I have to say, you wouldn't do a degree in English literature without reading a few books, would you? So they will play some games. Game design, it's about the structure of games, psychology, the reward systems that you get when you're playing them, the degree of challenge and curiosity that are developed in there, um, the learning through engaging. It's not solely about gamers playing games, it's not solely about coding it up and programming it, and it's not solely about graphics and animations. They're all part of it, but it's not only about those things. A game is a voluntary attempt to overcome unnecessary obstacles. That seems to be a, a fairly broad kind of definition. But that was written in 1978 before we had lots of game consoles and before we had this increasing trend toward gamification of the sorts of things that we're doing now, education and training. So I'll leave you to ponder some of those, we don't need to go through them all, but there are various definitions of the game, but they have an anatomy to them. They have mechanics, which are all the components of the game that at the level of data representation and the algorithms. The algorithms don't have to be on a computer, they can be on a board game. Dynamics, the runtime behavior of the mechanics acting on the user inputs and the outputs. The aesthetics, what's your emotional response in the player? Do you like the game? Do you get angry with the game? You ought to see my brother playing uh, Pictionary. He's incredibly angry when you don't understand what a sketch looks like. <laughs> and I've added this one here, the market, you need to know the business aspects. Is it going to make money? Is it sustainable? Is it going to grow? So we could sort of put those up in this kind of diagram. It all acts from the designers through to the users, through the market, but through those aspects of that anatomy. What are the educational areas that you could study and develop and need to know about to be a game designer? Just a few. <laughs> Obviously computer coding, hardware technology, but also human behavior. What's the narrative you're developing? The educational principles you might put into it. What about ethics and culture? How do we portray minorities in here? Should all games be actually written, these things, um, uh, some of these games are a little bit dodgy, I think. Uh, digital technology is obvious, but marketing? Some maths and stats, you need to know about that, otherwise you can't do all the digital technology. Also graphics and animation. But elements of directing and drama, psychology, user interfaces. There is an awful lot that you can learn by studying gaming, and not least logic. And these things are applicable across a whole range of different things, not just in the game area. Okay, so here's an example of applied gaming. This is from our hit lab. This is teaching people to get over their fear of spiders. Those spiders are actually not real. They are simply superimposed on your hand and they react to it. You can pick them up and I swear I can feel them tickling my palm as I'm walking across. I don't particularly like spiders. The plank, I've tried this in my own office, I have this um, um, virtual reality system. You get into an elevator at the bottom of the building, you go up to the top, and in front of you the lift doors open, there's a plank, and you're about you know, 50 stories up. I can't actually bring myself to walk out onto the plank. <laughs> and I've seen pictures on YouTube, you can find that people freaking out with these things. The interesting thing there is that's an opportunity because you get all of those physical sensations that you would get if you were actually doing that. And at the same time, you're in a safe environment and you start to learn uh, coping strategies. These are the sort of elements you can bring into the whole rehabilitation uh, and healthcare areas. 
I've almost finished, and I know we want time for questions. I just want to show you a couple of brief videos of some of the things you can do with virtual reality. <coughs> Augmented reality will come out of the game. So this is Tilt Brush. Some of you may have seen this, but I have one of these systems also. I would like to have some more. No, I'm not getting the sound. It doesn't matter. This person is painting in three-dimensional space with a little handheld device. It's a space about half the size of this front area here. And you can pick up different brushes and you can create this whole three-dimensional imagery and you can walk in amongst it and you can delete and you can add things to it. And you can create this whole world around you that is saved as a three-dimensional painting. This is a fairly rudimentary kind of a program, it's going to get better, but it's pretty good already. There are some amazing artists you can find on YouTube who can do things with this. When you put the goggles on, you are not aware of anything else but the world in which you've just created. Uh, and that is quite stunning. And this one here, um, almost to finish with, is called Holoportation. It's, it's to do with the HoloLens system from uh, Microsoft. And you, how many people here have used Skype? Right, just about everyone. Well, imagine if you could do that with three dimensions. So here's uh, what they're working on at the moment. Hollow portation. I'll try and get us to the to the right place. About two minutes in. Okay, I'll have to narrate it because I don't think you can hear the sound. This guy has his daughter in a different room, and they have a camera set up. So she's up there on the left-hand side, different room. He puts on the goggles, this is what he sees. This is what HoloLens is actually filming in here. It's superimposing it through his goggles into the room. And he's actually talking to her, he's hearing her. I'm sorry, I don't have the sound. And they're actually having a conversation. Now you can imagine how that's gonna change the idea of travel, the need for travel. It's almost like Kingsman, you want to see Kingsman movie? Look at guys sitting around the, the table. And if I just wind that on a little bit, you'll actually see a point where, I don't go too far. Right, so he makes it dissolve, he gets rid of it. <laughs> the other thing is, this camera system is actually recording that whole session. He can put the goggles back on when he gets around to it, and he can replay it. And he can walk around it. He actually be in amongst the recording. And then, as he says, right towards the end, that might not be all that convenient, but it's a 3D model, so he can, with gesture control, Shrink it down and. <laughs> and so These are the sorts of things that people are developing right now, and that the main thing that's limiting what people are doing is the amount of content that is there that needs to be developed by designers. I won't go through the similar thing for anatomy, and I'll just finish off with this last slide, which is really it's it's about new wealth creation for me, sustainable, ethical product design, integrating new technologies as we develop into the future, creating new ways for us to interact with our worlds and experience the world, not just for us, but in an inclusive way, and that's what I mean by inclusive design. It's about the elderly, it's about products for people who are suffering from dementia and uh, Alzheimer's, it's about people in wheelchairs, people with other disabilities, and actually a whole range of human experience that we can actually design for. And that's what we're going to be doing with that new degree. So thank you very much for your attendance tonight. I'm, I'm very pleased to see you all out here on a cold night. Um, this is the, the series which I hope that you're now familiar with. Feel free to keep looking at that and see what's coming up and registering for future talks. Thank you very much. be some people who no doubt have to shoot away, but if, if there are any other questions or any questions,
questions anyone has, I'll be happy to answer or I can see you outside afterwards. Yes? Well, my question is, uh, you know, you've been talking about the uh, top-down Okay, so I'll repeat the question. So, this is what I've been talking about is top down type of um, design. What about the bottom up then? You know, could we get more value out of the, the users um, designing and, and having input into those designs so they'd be much closer to use and more valuable to them? That, that's essentially the question. I think that's, that's quite right. The user focus is incredibly important, but I think what you need is an expertise in the process of doing this to actually tease those things out. So one of the things that you, you always will need to do is, is get the context right and understand the user. But often the user doesn't really necessarily understand what they need or want until they start seeing something develop and put in front of them and it becomes an iterative process. So the, the connectivity between the designer and the end user is, is all important and it, it has to be part of the process. That, that's how I would put it. Any other questions? Yes? Thank you very much for the presentation. I was just one example of the innocent packaging. <coughs> a bit of an example of a disconnect with the whole process because they design up something that's sort of um, compostable, but those PL, PLA products can't be put in um, and get connected and put it in recycling and destroy the recycling because they don't want them to make those particular products. So just the question is, is there an opportunity to not have that disconnecting when you talk about the use and recycling? So the design is <coughs> a little bit further into the connecting opportunity for materials for the yes. use and recycling. Yeah, so I think I think one of the things we have to do is not make sure we don't fool ourselves uh, when, when we're actually doing things. Uh, one thing, it, uh, you need to be aware of sustainability issues but you also need the tools to understand what those, those sustainability things are. As you say, right from the raw material, right from that first resource gathering, through the processing, to the product, through to the recycling, through to the end use and disposal. And, and very often we have technologies where people will focus on one part. And the, I'm sure we're all, we all understand the thing about the paper bag versus the plastic bag at the supermarket, or the disposable nappies versus the, the cloth nappies. And each one of them has things in them that you have to actually look way outside the immediate use of the of the product to actually see what's what's going on. I think you're you're quite right. You have to look right back as how do you even make the PLA in the first place? Thanks. All right. I, look, it, it is seven. I did talk a little long. Um, so if anyone would like to come down and say hello, just uh, feel free to do that. Otherwise, thanks again. Very much for attending.